What I'm doing at the moment is clearing out the fire from yesterday, taking out all the dust and all the debris, including the clinker, which we don't want in the fire because the clinker is like molten treacle and will stick to your metal and spoil your metal. So I've just cleared it all out, cleared out the end of the two iron where the air comes out and I'm now ready to light the fire. Coat across and some paper there which will help get it started. Now you can light the fire using matches or a flint and steel, but I'm going to use a modern method of a blowtorch. getting the fire going, years ago they would have used uh, charcoal on the fire, I'm using a mix of coal and charcoal and I'm going to forge a medieval bodkin, a war bodkin, and the one I'm going to forge is the needle bodkin, which is a long thin one, it's been about right throughout the Middle Ages, from the early Middle Ages, right up to and beyond the Battle of Towton, which was in 1461. It was used mainly to penetrate mail because it would force the links of the mail apart and penetrate deeply into the body but also it would go through the gambeson the padded jackets so it was a very efficient head that's why it was used for such a long time i'm going to make the needle bodkin out of a piece of square metal they would have used either square metal or flat metal for their other heads. They would have very seldom used round metal. Now the reason for that is because if you want round metal, you have to make it square first and then round it up. And of course that is extra time and effort and materials. So they would have used a piece of square metal sooner than a piece of round metal for making the needle bodkin and a lot of the other bodkins too. I'm going to heat this up to a nice yellow heat so that I can then forge the start of the socket. What I've done there is I've squared the end off and then I've just reduced the section a little bit so that I have the right amount of material to start forming the socket of the arrowhead. That's the piece that goes onto the shaft.
I started spreading the metal out for the socket and I've also squared the end back because we want the correct profile when the whole of the socket is flattened out otherwise it won't come out correctly. Now the next heat I'll take, I will be working on the back edge of the anvil to start flattening out the area for the socket. see that I've thinned the back edge of the socket out and I've been hitting half on the anvil and half off the anvil with the hammer to flatten it out there. Once I've got that shape then I can flatten out the front edge. gives me the rough shape of the socket. It needs refining now, it needs to be much wider across the top otherwise it won't give me the correct diameter for the shaft that the other head is going on to. And for that I'm going to move onto a little socket stake which is in the hardy hole in the anvil, which is this one here. stage and I will hammer the middle of the socket first pushing the metal out either side and thinning it out I don't want it too thin but equally so I don't want the socket wall to be too thick otherwise it will be a weakness when it, the arrow is fitted on to the, onto the arrow head see now that the socket is formed that's the shape that I need to start forming rolling it up into the proper socket shape. Now I'll do that by starting over on this step of the anvil in there and then finishing it on this edge of the anvil here. So I'm now going to roll that up into the socket. general shape of the socket but of course there's a gap here that I have to close in and 
the one piece rolls over the other piece so that we end up with that shape. So the next stage is to neck it in to close this gap at the end here. socket is now ready for hammering out on a socket stake to get it to the right diameter to go on the shaft. And the socket stake, I can have, it, have one either in the anvil here, I have mine in a vice which is just on the bench. So that's where we'll go next. What I've done there is I've had it in the little socket stake and I've rounded it up so that I've got it to the right diameter for the shaft that the arrowhead is going on to, which should be 3 8 diameter for this one because this is going to be a flight one. And it should end up nice and round and the end of the socket through there should be reasonably level so there's the minimum amount of grinding to do on it to get it level. From there I'm going to chop off that off the bar to the correct length to give the length of the point that I need. And that is done again on the anvil with the hardy which we use for cutting hot metal which is this one here. That will now break off using the tongs. And I'm ready to make the point of the other head now. start the point on the thick of the anvil because that is the quickest way to pull it down, to lengthen it.
the start of the arrow head. It is square at the moment, but a lot of the English arrow heads, the needle bodkins, weren't square, they were diamond section. So that's the next stage that I'm going to do, is to make it into a diamond section. the arrowhead, all ready for grinding. Once the head has been ground up by the grinders, it would then come back to the smith who would heat the point up to nearly a welding heat and then quench it so that it would give it some hardness because it's only the point that needs to be hard to make the penetration. The arrowhead now has been ground up and the end of the socket is nice and square so that it will sit on the shaft. True. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to heat it up in the fire and I'm going to quench it in lard or oil. We think they used lard for quenching um, because of the amount of lard that they were using and that gives you a finish on the arrowhead which means that it's less susceptible to rusting when the arrows were stored. So the next stage then to get the point as hot as I possibly can without burning it and then quench it in the quenching medium which in this case for us is not lard but oil cooking oil. And there is the finished needle bodkin. I have here three needle bodkins plus the one that I've just forged. 
This one is the largest needle bodkin that I've ever made. And this one is a copy of one from Ireland. Uh, why the Irish wanted such a long one, I don't know. There is a one that isn't quite as long as that from Urquhart Castle up in Scotland, but most of them tended to be the size that I forged them, which is this one, a typical English needle bodkin. And this one here is a German bodkin, and you'll notice that this one is square, as opposed to being diamond section. So that gives you an idea of the range and shape of the needle bodkin.